Carrie. Who are we? <laughs> we um, to together. Who are we? We're the screaming. <laughs> I mean, I think everybody just went, I'm done with these two. <laughs> you too. And it's it's like early in the day. We haven't even had a drink yet. And who did we interview? With a whole lot of espresso, we interviewed Michael Fabiano. Woohoo! Hello. Tanner Extraordinaire. He is in Paris right now, making his role debut in Tosca. Oh my gosh, one of our favorite operas. Hello, people. Mario, Mario, Mario. Yep. Yes, and but so much more than just a tenor. Like oh my gosh. His art, art smart. smart renaissance i mean this man his head on his shoulders is unbelievable i can't wait to see i mean listen we're excited about his career and where it's going musically and role wise but i'm also super excited to see what he does with this other part of his life and where he's going to end up i mean i could see him running several companies yep. maybe running the biggest opera company in the world i don't know or shaking it up and changing it i see I it, see it. Yep. Yeah. And v so eloquent in <gasps> his speaking. Yeah. Um, knowledgeable. Does he ever sleep? I wonder. I don't know. We didn't ask that. Why didn't we ask I that? I don't think he ever sleeps. But yeah, check out this clip. I, there's so many golden nuggets in this interview. It was Love really it. amazing. And I can't wait for all of you to, to see it. But here's a little sneak peek. Ding. And please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please keep watching our insanity. Keep watching our shenanigans. Bye. Bye. And by the way, as I always say to younger people, failure is not an end. Failure is just a waypoint to success. Yep. So, um, I think Oprah just failure. said that on Oprah just said that on our Instagram the other day. <laughs> <laughs> you learn from failure. There is no such thing as failure. Failure is just a roadmap to where you're always supposed to end up anyway. So. <laughs> And it, it it might it might be sour feeling and and might be rough in the really short term, but the reality is there's so many lessons built into that moment where things don't work that you can build into a pathway. Hello, is it me you're looking for? I Can only you, see Laurent and it's a you black wrong, screen. You have the wrong name. Oh my God, I have the wrong iPad. Can you see uh, me? No. no. But huh. I can hear your dulcet toned voice. Woo! Mario, Mario, Mario. There you go. I love that, that hello. Hi, ladies. Hi, hello, Michael. Hi. Am I supposed to you? both of you right now? If you I'm want, sorry. I'm, listen, it's 10 a.m. here, so this is a whole lot of coffee. Okay, I've had about five espressos already today, so I'm a little high already. Uh, this is four. <laughs> okay, four. Okay, good. Okay, All right. Michael, for you. Oh, my. Oh, my mess. Just for you. Thank you. When do you arrive? I'm sorry? When do you get to Madrid? Uh, on the 13th. Okay. Okay. Coming up. Right. It's soon. Me too. Soon. It's soon. It's Where great. are you? I'm in Paris right now. Okay. Nice. And Doing then... your first Tosca. Yep. It was the general last night and it went well. <gasps> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And can we please give a shout out to who I love very much, Joyce L. Coolery, and who I know is one of your besties, who is also doing her first Tosca. First and you guys Tosca? have been like, you went to see her. So, okay. Hey, this is awesome sauce, people. Tosca is awesome. Now, she was great, and I was really proud of her for that show. Awesome. I saw a great new tenor called John Tettleman. He's really talented, too. Yeah, cool. Cool. Yes. It's a good group, and they did it. They did a great job up there in Lille. I Lille. love that, but I love that two awesome people are debuting Tosca right now. That's just super cool. Thank you. The yeah. more the merrier. Welcome to the club. Welcome to Here, the club. Here's done Tosca a lot. Well, I think I think there's a Tosca right up there. Yeah, there's a Tosca right up there too. So. It's Yay! On, 
Yeah, I'm still waiting for the song Qui, though. I mean, we sang Mario, Mario, Mario. Where's the song Qui? Son Qui. Thank you, thank you. All right. Yay, yay. For an hour, that's what I'm going to do on the stage on opening night. Hold that forever, Son Qui. Please, please do that. Who's conducting? Montanado. Carlo Montanado. Oh, cool. Nice. Okay. Love that. Also, uh, what's that one in the middle that's huge that always makes me giggle when the tenors hold it forever? Vittoria, Vittoria. Yeah. Now, do you do Vittoria? No, I think, I, I think it's cheap. I don't like it. I just do too. Vittoria. Yes. I so, love it. By the way, you know, if you look at if you look at Puccini's writing, he wrote a whole explanation about why he doesn't want three fermate over those notes. He thinks it's brutal and ugly. In his own words, he said it. So I don't know. It's not that I'm doing a comiscrito, but I just don't like it as much. And Maria Gresta is your Tosca. She is. It's also her first her role debut. Yes. Holy shit! Whoa, shimola. that's some big stuff, man. Okay, are you going to be able to do this with audience? I was just going to ask that. 800 people the first night. The first two nights, 800. And you guys know Paris is very big. So 800 out of like, is it 3,000, Sandra? I don't at remember least, exactly. Yeah, at least. It's small, you know. And last night there was like a, a, you know, an invited group from inside the house. And it felt like 400 maybe. It felt small. It felt small. small. But... I'll say that there are people there. So let's take it, take it for that there's at least somewhat of an audience. That's a step. More so than before. Now, tell me this. I, I mean, you know, everybody over here in the U.S. is, well, hopefully we're almost at 50% vaccinated. So what's the vaccination stuff going on over there? Is it happening? I, I, first of all, there's a, great, there's a great resource on Bloomberg. I don't know if you see it. Bloomberg has a great, like, chart for every single country. Oh, uh, cool. Okay. Date. And you just need to, you don't even need to be a member of Bloomberg to see it. And France, I think, is like at 30% now. So they're, it's okay. You know, I, I understand on June 9th here, they're going to relax a lot of the rules. Yeah. I'll be able to go to the gym again, which okay. is a nice, that's a progress. Hey, you and should then talk to Christian Van Horn. He got a letter from the doctor and he could go to the gym there. Mm -hmm. You're kidding. No. Yeah. You can, all you need is a letter from the doctor. Mm -hmm. Talk to Christian. Yeah. Or Solomon. Mm -hmm. They both, you just, it's a, it's a formality. Michael, your face is priceless. Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to about to have a heart attack. I've tried to show up to all these gym. They said, you need to, you need to have a doctor's note. And I didn't know that you actually had to get, you can just get a letter like this. Yeah. Ask Sophie Joyce. She'll hook you up. Oh, you should ask it. me. <laughs> you should watch the screaming divas you would know this stuff oh yeah that's true kristen talked about it <laughs> oh, oh we're kidding you <laughs> sorry we interrupted so 800 people what are what are they doing are you still getting tested or is the audience getting tested it, i don't know about the audience here i know we have we've had i don't know six tests eight something like that now i'm vaccinated uh most of my cast is not vaccinated mm. um but, you know, it looks like they're doing a good job. They're, they're uh, you know, we were, both in, we were both in Madrid when this was, you know, much more grave than it is now. And they were pretty ruthless in terms of testing and rules and regulations. And I'd say it's the same kind of thing here. Tough rules, tough, tough regulations, but okay. Okay. Well, hey, yeah. you get to sing. Yeah. Yeah, can exactly. We, can we, like, backtrack? Because I'm curious. We've asked pretty much everybody. Well, now that we're kind of coming out of this, how has this last year been for you? How have you been able to keep yourself sane? And I know you were one of the fortunate ones that was able to sing a couple of times throughout the year, but um, how have you taken care of yourself and how has life been? Uh, yes, I was fortunate that I got to work in Napoli and in Madrid and a couple of uh, smaller things in the United States in the winter. Uh, but I would say it was, you know, one quarter of the normal year that I had. Of course. You know, that. And uh, it was hard. I mean, look, I got divorced last year in the middle of this crisis. So, oh, Mike, I'm so sorry. And my family, my parents had just gotten divorced too. So it was a, it was a really strange year. Wow. Weird way. 
COVID seemed like distant because I had other things spinning in my world. And it's terrible to say this, please forgive the, the, the context, but in a way, the, the period of down, everybody being down gave me a time to reset and regroup because it was just such a horrible last couple of years for me. Yeah, it's not, that's not horrible to say. Mm -mm, yeah. You know, it's, it's, I think a lot of people that we've interviewed have said that, haven't they, Carrie? They yeah. said that they all needed this, this break to really mentally and physically just rethink and reset their, their brains and their bodies and t to rest. You know, it's, it's like mother nature said to all of us, well, time out, you know, yeah. like a big yeah. time out. Well, we def, I definitely had that. Um, it gave me time to, um, rework on my voice. It gave me time to rework on my plans for the future in this business and in other businesses. Mm -hmm. And it was hard, you know, this, like for, for you ladies, this is our, you know, our life's blood and what we really, we wake up hungry to do every day, even on the bad days. So to not be able to, to, to I found the thing that started to get hard was I love to study. I study a lot. And I found that waking up every single day and studying and then not actually getting to actuate my studies on stage started it started to have this downhill effect in my brain and I, I hit a bit of a wall in the winter you know like Jesus you know when is this really going to start again mm -hmm. you know do I really want to do this I'm sure a lot of us have asked that question you know but thank do we want to no, you know. thank you for saying that because a lot of people really don't want to admit that publicly and I think that's no. been rampant in this business right now. It's, it's for sure. I mean, it, come on, let's be human here. I'm sure we all have said many times in the confines of our home when we've been secluded from most of our friends and family, is this really the life I want to live, especially in a business that hasn't gone out of the way to support us as artists? Thank you. Let's Mike. be honest about it. Yeah, but let's just be brutal and upfront. We have a union that doesn't support us. And with the exception of some great leaders in our business, a lot of our opera companies have not fulfilled their fiduciary and moral responsibilities to artists, period. And mm. there, are, there, are some, there are some great exceptions. There yes, are. There are. Some people and leaders that have done their job and they have gone to their boards and said, you have to do this. It's mandatory. If we don't have artists, if we don't have solo artists that are important, we don't have art, period. And those people are winners for me. Madrid, Juan Matabash. Juan is the champion of all. You know, he yeah. from the beginning was just was on the ground saying, we're not stopping. You know, yeah. I don't care that uh, there's this pandemic going on. We'll figure it out. We'll make it happen. Yeah. Find other sponsors that are going to sponsor security measures and health measures. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of the excuses I've heard has been, oh, it's so much more expensive to produce or it's this or it's that. Find people or find find partnerships or collaborations with companies that can provide product to make sure that the, the situation is is solvent. Totally. I'm sure you ladies have talked about this a lot with a lot of artists. I believe you have. Um, but certainly I have, you know, I've had Sandra, Carrie, you 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 talk to these leaders all the time. and. I do too. It's our work, you know. We want to know what the status of affairs are. We want to know what all this, the, you know, every single status is. And I don't know. It's it's left me disheartened in some of the leadership in our business. Yeah. And reconsidering uh, it, it forced me to reconsider my long and midterm goals. Let's say that. Yeah. And there's my goals are still to sing and to share music. But let's just say like yours and others, I'm sure that they've shifted. I'm sure that there's a shift in the, the diameter and the direction of those goals. And Are you think of getting into management maybe? I don't know. Let's say it like that. Okay. Okay. And could be, uh, it, 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 it's certainly interesting to me. And I run a foundation, I, you know, I, hmm. I have, over 50 people that work for me now at ArtSmart. So awesome. run, running people, running um, an organization, I enjoy it. I enjoy the, the thrill and the hunt of it. Cool. So I, we really want to talk to you about that, about ArtSmart, uh, ArtSmart and uh, Resonance. Resonance, yeah. The, um, 
I, but I do have to say, I, I think it's so, I love that you just said what you said, Michael, especially because yesterday I tuned into an AGMA meeting about the Met and my, whatever you want to, whatever everybody's opinion about that is their own. But what I kept thinking was, this is just going to trickle down through the business all over the world. And mm -hmm. when I look at my own financial health and financial future, and I'm in my midlife, I thought this maybe isn't this, the, this isn't the right business for that. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you think, do these boards know this? Do these boards know that the people that are standing on their stage making what an opera house is are, are rethinking this because financially this doesn't make sense for the majority of singers for them. Not, not the top. I mean, even the top. No, tier, even it, me. It, Carry it just, it's just kind of like financially, or, I mean, you, whatever. Yeah. 12.65% cut in your fees. No, I'm sorry. Uh, so there, there is a pernicious problem, okay? First of all, we have a union that clearly does not advocate for soloists. Let's be really blunt about it. They yep. just don't. They can, tell, they, can, they can say all they want that they do. In this negotiation with, with the other authorities, where was one leading artist of note around the world? Can you tell me one? Were you present or invited, Sandra? Was I Russell didn't even know these cuts were happening. Was was Russell Thomas? What about Latanya Moore? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think about great artists that have been doing it a lot at the Metropolitan Opera. Okay, people that are constantly on the stage. Christine, where were they invited? Where mm -hmm. Christine Gerke? Where was she? Where were those people invited to be a part of the discussions? How come people that really work and have the acclaim and have put in the time and the sweat were not invited to this process? Please explain it to me. I know. I don't understand it. I don't either. So, they tried. It didn't really go over very well. No. Mm -hmm. The people that do have the solo careers, all three of us here, Russell Thomas, Latanya Morris, all those folks. Yeah. We have hard expenses, publicity expenses, managerial expenses, cost of living expenses, travel, that travel expenses that marginalize that number right from the beginning. So an individual in our, on our side of the field that might make a half a million dollars a year Sounds great. Wow, five hundred thousand dollars a year yeah. is the top bracket, right? Minus. But at the end of the day, we're talking. You know, people are bringing home one hundred and seventy-five yeah. if they're like two hundred. I look at fifty percent. Whatever I take, whatever I bring home, fifty percent. I I, I automatically know are gone to expenses. Yeah, of course, but they. And I think I think if we had a Sandra or a Carrie or a Russell Thomas who's who's aggressive or people like that that were in there and really putting their hands on the table and saying, hold on a second. You don't have the greatest artistry if you don't have the greatest artists, number one. Let's just be honest about that. I'm tired of everybody trying to be humble and worry about offending other people. The re there's a reason why there are stars in our business. There is a reason why there are acclaimed people in our business because they have the talent, they have the hunger, they have the drive and they do it all the time. And they go to the mat and they study and they work hard. They work hard. I know you ladies work hard. You know, it is, yep. and the work includes being away from family all the time. Huge personal sacrifice, yep. financial sacrifice. You know that too. What, I, I know it, but I, I don't wanna speak for myself. I'm, I'm, my point is the people that do it that are really the ones that are getting hit the hardest right now are, were not spoken for in these negotiations. I know. No one was advocating for that position, can which I, is crazy. Can I question one thing? Sure. We are going to take a cut. In any other business, if you had a signed contract, they wouldn't allow this. But yet, I have a signed contract for the Metropolitan Opera next season, signed saying, this is your fee. And now, because our union renegotiated this contract, they can change it? Right. Mm -hmm. How, any other business, they would say you're smoking crack. I'm sorry. It depends yeah. on how the contract's written. There's loopholes in there for Adam yeah. to be able to say that they can do that. And but where, where I would like to know, where exactly does it say that a contract is subject to renegotiation? Does it say that? I don't uh, see that. I think there's something. I, no, don't quote me because they 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 did talk about this, and um, I think Isabel Leonard was the uh, was the one that asked this. How are, how legally are you able to do that? And um, they've 
uh, it's just an, I don't, can't remember if it's in the bylaws or if it's something about the original okay. Adam contract that they, they're allowed to do that. You know, I want to say that the chorus and other people that are also negotiating, they're wonderful. This is the, this is a crowning glory organization. This is the greatest opera chorus in the world that we're talking about. They're an incredible organization. Nobody should have to be enduring pain right now. We should be working with other organizations, other, other even grantees for that matter, to find new and new possible lines of funding and figuring out new economic possibilities to make sure that there wouldn't be any sort of cut. And I'd be really happy to talk about that too, because I'm sure all of us have many ideas. I just want to state affirmatively that everyone that's being affected are with talent and wonderful, and we need to do our best to protect everyone. You know what? I'm going to be optimistic. I have faith that if uh, if things resolve themselves quickly, we come to the negotiating table, we bargain right, and we make some uh, positive appeals about why artistry is important. Mm -hmm. I think in a few years we're going to be back on track, and we'll be able to encourage new audiences to get back in the seats again. Venga. I love they that. need to hire you. They need to hire you <laughs> for funding. You like to, how to get, you are a great speaker. I know that you were a debater in high school, right? Yes. <laughs> it shows. It shows, you know? Michael. Mm -hmm. he, needed, he needed to hire you to, to debate all this. But that, okay, pivot. Well, wait, I, wait. Um, I, I think I'm going to go back to law school. So then I'll catch up with you in like four or five years, Michael, when you're like ready to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> we'll do it together. All right. Okay. I think fun. that'd be fun. You mm -hmm. two together. Woo. Dynamic duo. There you go. Okay. So when we did Cyrano in Madrid. Oh my God. You asked me, and I still think about this. You asked me a question and you were the first person that ever asked me that. How do you know when it's time to move into larger, more dramatic repertoire? Do you remember that? We we're sitting in the audience and I thought, ah, I don't know how to answer that. And remember, and I said to you, like, you just know. <laughs> I mean, that's a stupid, stupid answer, but I was like, well, you just kind of know. And obviously you figured it out because now you're singing Tosca. So yeah. what was the answer? Well, how did you figure it out? It, thank you. I, you know, it's funny. You're making me recall that time together now. Um, I'll give you an answer. It's going to sound a little cryptic. Um, crises. I, I would say that in crisis, when you're forced to figure out what works and what doesn't, and when you solve it, you know, is it time to pivot or do you stay on the right track? Mm. And okay. I find like the voice goes in these kind of waves of six to seven year lumps where you have six kind of good years and then you have a bump and then you have six or seven years and then there's another bump and a kind of recalibration. And I feel like I've had two of them. And one of them started about two years ago, the, the kind of recalibration points. And I realized as I started opening other scores, other music, just to see is, is the reason why certain things are not working as easily for me because my voice is lowering or is it getting wider? What when I opened the scores, I'm not going to name them because they're big and things were a lot easier than say in a Rodolfo. Mm -hmm. It told everything. And so what I started doing is working through, let's call it the Spinto repertory in the last year, piece by piece. And then after singing it for a couple of hours in a day, step back in a Rodolfo and suddenly it's easier to sing. And mm -hmm. if I sing it in that position in that place that's more gathered and a little lower, I was actually able to get higher faster, able to do more diminuendi, able to do things that I wasn't able to do in just a kind of lyric with color, I call it lyric, full yeah. lyric framework. And I, I, I admit, I may have gone a little too early. I sang Don Carlo and Louisa Miller when I was 31. And it was uh, maybe a, a year or two too early, but I wanted to try. I wanted to see if it worked. Mm -hmm. I sang them really well. I was, a, I would say it was slightly green when I did it, but I still did well. Now those roles are like meat and potatoes for me. They're, you know, they're fun. They don't slightly work. Green. Yeah. Ready. Whereas Get it. Rick, Rick, you know, Traviata, Bohem make me nervous, you know? Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's, so, okay, that's interesting. So you figured it out in your way. And yeah. you know, that's, I've done that as well. And I, I don't know about you, Carrie, like when I've always had one role that I always go back to and bring that technique in into the newer roles. And that's for me, Trovatore. Trovatore huh. is a role that I always go back to to work on vocal issues. If I was like, I felt my voice was growing. It's like, oh, go back to Trovatore and sing through that and see where the voice is now. Oh, how did that change? And like, I always have that milestone role that I use to see, oh, that's how my voice is changing now. And yeah. then you can kind of grow with that. And you know, I thought it would have been the Duke because I've been singing the Duke since I was really young. Mm -hmm. And I just realized I was started to really constrict the voice singing it when I turned 35 and I just couldn't, I couldn't find freedom in it anymore. And I just knew, okay, this higher registration for me, this upper mm -hmm. laying in the passaggio all night is not solvent for me anymore. It just doesn't work, you know? Huh. Okay. Interesting. I was, when you were talking, I was thinking, okay, I'm backwards. I'm, I'm opposite of you. Whenever I went into the bigger stuff, I had to always come back to Mozart because Mozart was what my foundation was built on. But, huh. but then when you said, but I, when you said, when I lowered and gathered, and then I was able to go to the top, that that works for everyone. If the middle functions, if the middle is where it is right, then the top and the bottom work period, no matter what you're singing. So um, and that's my opinion, but, um, no, 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 but, I but I thought that was, I, I love these conversations because how we all approach the same goal is just so cool and how our minds work and figure it around, you know, figure it out as our bodies change, as we get older. I mean, there's always these fluctuations as we move through different things and you'll have another bump. Maybe it'll be at 45 well, yeah. or 48 or 50. You know what I mean? It, it'll be really interesting to see. I like your words, you call it a bump. For me, it's like transition or hormonal or whatever it is, but- um, Well, the body but, changes every seven years. Your body every seven years completely changes every cell. So maybe Michael, that's why you feel it's every seven, six or seven years. Cause huh, you're- I that, It makes sense then. Right, yeah. it's super every, cool. It, it regenerates itself every seven years. And that was like, not me just picking it out of the air. Uh, a doctor told me that. So, so, so how does Conrad Dossi feel? I mean, where, like for your first one, cause I think this is so cool. I remember my first hospital, like it was yesterday. Um, but I, you know, and where I've come from that one to where I am now with her, same with Sandra, I'm sure I'm no doubt. Um, where, where are your favorite moments? Where are your moments were like, mm, I still want to work on that or I'm still doing, if you feel like talking about those moments, but. Uh, first of all, I find it a joy to sing. Um, relatively easy, I have to say. Um, and unexpectedly fun. I didn't expect it to be a fun night um, because I'd never done it, which is crazy. I'm 37, I've been in, in a full career for now my 13th season. Mm -hmm. And Everyone said, you, they, no one can believe that it's my first Cabaret Dulce and I've sung a lot of Verdi. I've sung 12 Verdi roles now. Wow. And I find it, I don't want to say easy, but I want to say fun-filled, relatively relaxing, and kind of covers all the bases in terms of colors. Oh. Everywhere, total ecstasy to total ang anger and rancor. Yeah. And it kind of allows that, that Swiss army knife to be deployed the entire evening. <laughs> which is not, yeah it's cool and that's awesome yeah and do I have any like pain points in the score no because it's it's not that high of an opera and it's fun and I I like him I can't explain it it's just a great role do you have I'm a favorite happy. do you have a favorite moment so far um yes I would say from the beginning of the third act all the way to O Dolce Mani for Why? you, I don't just have one hard high C in there at that uh, point. And, and I do milk that one. <laughs> I, do, I did. I remember once the one conductor, I think it was Marco Armidato. He's like, okay, Sandra, you're yeah. done. Okay, that's enough. Are you done? Are you done? Are you that's done? hysterical. I was in DC and I got too wrapped up in the emotions of that. And I wasn't, I didn't prepare that. You have to think about where you're going from the bottom to the top. 
And I knew, I knew once that note before I was like, oh girl, oh, this is not going to be oh. good. I mean, it came out, but you were like, oh, get off that girl. That's a hot <laughs> damn mess. And Michael Bateser, who I has been a part of my whole career was in the pit because he's playing. And I saw him afterwards and I'm like, don't even say a word. And he was like, you didn't do that one, right? <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Let's, okay. So now that you say you feel like your voice is changing, can we discuss any future bucket list. direction bucket mm -hmm. list roles bucket sure. list yeah pick them off i'll tell you yes or no oh okay so so let's see after tosca then we're going to be you've done balo so i have would you done any other puccini like pinkerton and all those things that's on pinkerton i don't yeah i'll do them again sure when it comes i would say chenier mm -hmm. desperate yes i'll do it for sure adriana uh -huh. definitely it's booked yeah uh are you gonna ask the big one i aida no i don't like him mm, he's a bit of adult isn't he i can't stand him i'm not interested if the character doesn't have is not dynamic that's kind of my gauge if he's more if he's not at least two-dimensional i don't want to play him because i can't connect to him and i'll be honest my voice won't speak as well you know i'm i'm an emotional person on stage and if i don't connect uh, in a dynamic way to the character. I'm going to be blocked here. This will be blocked too. Mm, interesting. Do you have somebody, because the roles that I'm, that I'm talking, that we're talking about, like I think of Delmonico in my head, kind of as a, as an example, sure. do you have somebody that you kind of look to as a, as a reference? Like, hmm, he sang it. So maybe, you know, like this, my voice is similar. Pertile. Yeah. Pertile. Okay. Yeah, earlier. I love Delmonico too. He's one of my heroes as well. Um, and I'll probably follow in that line with some variations and rep. Um, I, you know, one thing I do like that a lot of those other er earlier tenors didn't do a lot of is the early Verdi, like Masnadieri mm -hmm. and uh, Battaglia di Legnano, thing yeah. Ernani. Ernani they did, but you know, those things, I, I really look forward to those roles. I want to do that. It's coming. Let's just say that. Might be good. Otello, are you going to go that heavy? I would love to. Yes, someday. Okay. All right. Forza, hmm? Forza Peak Dom, Peter yeah. Grimes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like that. Dom, start working on it now. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I'm going to, I, it won't be a few years. Let's say that. Because oh it's all that Russian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You did it in Chicago. No, am I right? Yeah. That yeah. was my first one with Brandon Jovanovich. But you have two incredible arias. Oh my God. But you work all night. You know, so what? you are, you, it is nonstop. And I get to go and sing these pretty arias and go, bye bye. <laughs> I'm going to kill myself now. It's a, even if it's a lot of work, it's so grateful. It's not an ungrateful night. No, it isn't. Not at it's all. Like you're right. Cool. Carrie right. has a question. Yeah, we've got a, I really want to talk about the uh, resonance that yeah. you, released this year, even though I know that that was something that you had wanted earlier on from what I researched. And then I'd like to talk about Art Smart. So it's up to you. Where do you want to go first? Start with resonance. Go for it. Okay. I loved that, the concept. Do you want to tell everybody what that is and why you did this? Because you'll probably so, say it way better than I will. <laughs> sure. No. So eight years ago, I was sitting with a dear friend of mine and we were saying, what is the biggest pain point that artists face right now. And I ended up polling, most people don't know this, but I polled over 1500 artists. I called and wrote emails and Facebook messengered. I did everything. Many, 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 many artists, over 1500. And I asked them about their problems in their life. You know, uh, how do you get work? What happens when you don't get paid? What happens on the job if the conditions are poor, blah, 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 blah. There was a whole questionnaire. And two things that I learned from a majority of artists, and we're not just talking opera singers here, we're talking music theater, jazz performers, dancers, oh, okay. um, carnival acts. I was able to talk to many different types of groups. Um, people had a big problem collecting money on time or actually collecting the money they were owed that really hit people, especially not on the top echelon of their industry. So people that often did that did not have management or an agent mm. had a very grave difficulty 
um, having accounts payable. Mm -hmm. And I didn't never really recognize that as a problem personally, but it really was a problem for 900 plus of the people I polled, which is a serious number. It's not a marginal amount of people. So payment was one and secure contracting was two. Mm -hmm. And with confidence, you know, if you have a, if you have your name on a line, it guarantees that you will have a job. You're mm -hmm. not going to be fired for whatever reason. So I, with a few partners, created a technological solution in 2013 and 14 that created um, a mobile device that allowed artists to find last minute jobs securely and get paid on time. And I put it in a, a big beta test. It was a private selected beta, but it was big. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. It didn't succeed. And I invested a lot of my own capital in it. Okay. And it was hurtful. It was hard because I put, I don't know, 3000 hours of my time into it over two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. yep. And I sat down and I said, why did this thing fail? What did I do wrong? And one of the reasons was that it was too cumbersome. It was too heavy. It was too difficult to manage. I didn't have en enough developers building it. Okay. So I stepped back. I asked myself, why did I do what I did? And the answer was, I wanted to help artists have more dignity in their lives. Because when I was a young man, when I was 21, two, three, four, five, the only ways that I made money was either competitions, I'm sure we, we all know that game, mm -hmm. or random jobs that I would find on Craigslist, on bookings online, you know, wedding for $50, funeral for 75, uh, bar mitzvah for 20 bucks or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I made a lot of money doing it, huh? I, but it was hustling. It was constantly searching for these jobs and then I re remembered, I had maybe 50 experiences where these people would say, oh, I know we told you we're going to give you $100, but do you mind if you take 50 today? I only got a 50 on me. Or uh, can I pay you next week? I forgot my checkbook and I left it at home or whatever it was. And so then I recalled, okay, I actually had the problem too a dozen years ago. I was struggling and I just put it away. So I stepped back. I ended up creating ArtSmart. I funded it by the generosity of people. Fine, pause. We'll get to ArtSmart in a minute. Years later, another group of really smart men came to me and said, Michael, uh, we have this product. We know you were working on something like this five years ago or so. Mm. Could you talk to us about it? What your struggles were, what it was. And we ended up having such a great um, rapport and agreement. And I realized what they were doing was going to be successful that I just joined. I partnered and uh, oh. gave them my, all of my work that I had done for years, my contacts, um, the data base that I had built, you know, which was expensive. And um, they have, they've built this really fantastic technological solution called Resonance that allows art workers, let's say creative workers to find last minute employment or find resources and tools to support their careers. Wow. And, um, you know, we're, we're iterating it as we speak. We're coming up with uh, new ways that people can get paid if they bring more people on the platform, more ways for people to get hired for last minute jobs. We're starting to link ourselves with small concert venues and bars and organizations like that. So love that. Guitar and, and singers can find last minute gigs, wow. especially as we get out of this COVID moment. Well, I was going to say, yeah, that's a great resource for people now, isn't it? No, I yeah. was thinking about like all the bars downtown. I live in Nashville now, um, Michael, and all the bars downtown Nashville, they're, I'm sure that they're constantly in need of somebody cancels. They need somebody new. They've got three floors. They have three different bands on all three floors. I mean, wow. the, yeah. and how that, easy to be able to go to something like that and book someone. Yeah. You know, when I was in 2013, 14, I created this vast database of all the bars on the East Coast, bars and clubs and mm -hmm. churches. And I started building them into the network. And then my, my first product didn't work. And uh, so now we're, we're redoing that right now okay. and I upload a lot of those institutions. Right. And connect the thing that we're working on, which is why we need more funding now, is we're working on doing push notifications. So when a bar owner has a last minute gig come along, they can push the opportunity to the five most close workers in that vicinity and say, this oh. job right now if you want it for fifty dollars if you want it for 280 dollars whatever click right. yes and then it's done is it and nation is it america wide or is it just in certain you, cities 
no, you can use this everywhere, but we want this service to, we want to test the service in New York first, oh, this okay. service. So, so how that, does that link with ArtSmart now? How did? Oh, it's a very, so the link is this. I stepped back in 2015, 14, and asked myself, why did my first company fail? And the answer was, I was too focused on winning and profit and gain and not focused enough on the actual problem. It, you, obviously, when you build a business, you have to think about money. It's right. obvious. And you, if you don't think about money at all, you'll, fa you'll falter too. But I think I was so obsessed with the numbers and the number game that I lost focus on why I was doing what I was doing. And that was my failure. And by the way, as I always say to younger people, failure is not an end. Failure is just a waypoint to success. Yep. So um, I think Oprah, Oprah, just said that on, Oprah just said that on our Instagram the other day. <laughs> <laughs> you learn from failure. There is no such thing as failure. Failure is just a roadmap to where you're always supposed to end up anyway. So, yeah. And it, 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 might, it might be sour feeling and it might be rough in the really short term. But the reality is there's so many lessons built into that moment where things don't work that you can build into a pathway. And so the answer that I found was so many artists spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on education and then don't get to enter into a career that affords them more than $50,000 a year for many years. And I said to myself, what's the fastest way I can put some money in artists' pockets with as little pain as possible? What's like, how do I get the two X, the crosses on the axis to mm -hmm. come together? Mm -hmm. it. And the answer oddly became pairing up qualified musicians with um, children that lacked music education. And so I found a couple of partner schools, started in Newark, New Jersey, and we linked really talented opera singers in the beginning mm -hmm. with a couple of schools. And it's blown out now ArtSmart is now an organization that provides free music instruction year round every single week to um, uh, 30 different public schools and charters around the United States. And it's probably going to be double in size next year in nine cities. Okay. Wow. That was my question because yeah. I noticed that you weren't really South in the U S. And so I was wondering if you were going to work your way down South. Charleston next year okay. is the Southern city. Uh, we'll be in Seattle new next year. It looks like Detroit and LA are coming as well next year. Cool. In addition, as we are, which we're growing wide. So in San Francisco, we're going to add three or four programs. Okay. In Newark, New Jersey, um, it's going to be growing twofold. For instance, I've been able to come. You know, fundraising is a labor of love. It's it's a lot of work, but I honestly like to do it. It's fun for me cool. because I find building relationships with folks that really want to connect to their communities mm -hmm. is a positive thing. Yeah. It's not, I'm not asking for money for me, by the way, I'm asking money for a cause that is important, which is educating children, but at the same time, feeding artists, yeah. paying art a really fair wage. We pay people well at art smart. Okay. We give them a really legitimate wage per hour. Cool. And uh, that was one of our, our points. And so one of the, the, you know, like the great deals of the last 18 months has been help me employ more artists right now. I want to employ more artists. We were able to employ 10 more artists this year cool. because wow. of new donors and the crisis. And I said, I need more help. Let's go. Yeah. Let's employ them. And so the, the paradigm is both. It's employ great people and also give children an opportunity that they otherwise would never have. Love it. Thank you. Wow. Um, okay, so you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but you hmm. say we all learn from our failures, right? Hmm. And I'm sorry to say, you know, that your marriage, you just got divorced. What, what have you learned about yourself from that? Thank you. No, I'm, I'm very open about all this. Um, because it might help other, our, our viewers, you know, it's, sure. it's a tough business sure. to be married in. Sure. First of all, lesson number one presence in other people's lives, being present, mm. to know the person you're with and understand who they are and concurrently make sure they know who you are. Mm. This career does not lend itself to presence. 
it's hard. And there's a, there's a prism in there where we think we're present because we're personalities and we're, we have energy and we're charismatic and all those things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're actively in other people's lives or we understand other people that we're with. And so the lesson learned, number one, is clearly I was not present enough to know who I was marrying. Mm. Clearly, I wasn't present enough for him to know who I was. Mm. That's it. Um, that's the lesson learned. And it's a lesson that I will take to the bank moving forward, that I will be more actively present in the life of the next person that comes. Okay. Um, and I hope that that person can see me more. That also means that I have to vet better because I wasn't vetting. And um, that was my mistake. Um, what did I learn? Um, that's a big one. I think that's, re- that's, that's the big one. one. Yeah. Like, there are other littler things, but yeah. we can itsy bits, it, itsy bitsy it, but that's really the answer. Being, um, pre- being present. I, being present, you know. It's tough being married to an opera singer. Let's be honest. Opera singers are filled with personality. All of us have a healthy dose of ego. Every one of us. And if we didn't, we wouldn't be who we are. It's true. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't be on the stage. We wouldn't be having success. And it would be harder for us to do our jobs. Yeah. This is part of our lives. And so there's got to be this reciprocity where when we find people, there's a kind of mutual understanding that they know who they're marrying and they know that that's what comes with the, the, you know, the contract. And if they accept that, then that's not the person to marry. And that's, that's, I guess the second. Why are you laughing? (laughs) I'm laughing because, you know, I mean, Michael, I, I, you know, I've been with my husband, God forever. We've it's over 20 years. And uh, this year though, and we've been, we've run that roller coaster ride. Marriage to me is a roller coaster ride. It's, it's ups and downs, just like life itself. And there's no greener pasture, whether you're with somebody or whether you're alone. I mean, it's hard either way. But um, this last year, without having somewhere to channel that kind of energy that we have as artists, I, my husband was like, woman. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and Get hence, outside, just leave. Yeah, the, I mean, and hence Screaming Divas was born. I mean, it was like I, you know, we have to have some outlet for that energy that we carry with us 24-7. So um, it just made me laugh because it is, it's true. I mean, even though like he and I know each other and we accept each other for all the good and bad and awesomeness, and we've wrote we've ridden this roller coaster forever, it still was a learning curve. It's this COVID and being home and being together this much was another learning curve. So it's yeah. interesting, you know. Good for you good. for for doing the soul searching and good for you. It's huge. Yeah. I don't think that ever stops, whether you're, it never stopped for me and never stopped for us. We constantly were changing and growing and learning and figuring out how to make something that we both really loved and wanted to make work long-term. Does that make sense? Once you know what you're saying, when, once you do what you're saying, does that make sense? Of course. Yeah. Well, I during that. Thank you. No, it was, it was a, it was a hard couple I'm of so years. Sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Right. I'm, um, I'm, I'm there now. So good for you. Okay. Can we talk about another subject that I found when I was researching you? Because even though I feel like, I mean, gosh, I've known who you are forever. I pass across several times, but um, I really was interested in the Queeby documentary. Oh my. Because um, (laughs) called Crescendo, because it talked about you coming out and being advised early on in your career to not do that. And I, you know, honestly, Michael, my first question, you don't have to answer this was, do you regret that decision listening to those, listening to those voices? I feel like, I don't know about Sandra, but there were voices that said certain things to me early on in my career. I mean, we can even, it's not the same thing, but even about children, those kinds of things that we were all told. And I was just wondering, do you regret that, listening to that? You bet. Um, it was a, a grave mistake of mine and probably led to a little bit of, I would call inner anger, uh, mm. that probably showed itself publicly, you know, I'm sure it did. 
frustration that I couldn't always be fully who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely have a personality, huh? <laughs> but it's <laughs> uh, a good thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but I would say that the kind of warm, gushy Michael puppy dog, which I can really be, mm -hmm. uh, was really blocked when I was hiding. Mm. And I couldn't show that. It was very hard to show the nice side, my, my heart to people because I was working very hard to stay like a square and in the box. Mm. And it, what was harder for me, which is what I said in this film, which is gonna actually, it's in, it was, it's in the Tribeca Film Festival. It's in a lot of film festivals coming up. Mm -hmm. um, um, one of the things that I said was that I was open with my family and my friends, but in my mm. career, I was completely quiet, <sighs> which is the worst. It, I mean, in a way it was like going backwards forwards it was terrible and um had i had had i done it all over again i literally would have ignored the advice of the elders that were telling me stay quiet don't tell people you're i remember um uh a former teacher of mine mm -hmm. telling me no woman this is going to sound very shocking no woman in the audience is going to get excited about a gay man in tights. They're only going to get excited about a straight man in tights if you're singing Romeo and Juliet. So you can't tell anybody. And I'll always remember that line because, you know, I just had to keep my mouth shut. I felt like if I was betraying my elders for so yeah. long. Yeah. Wow. And I was wrong, totally wrong. But I have to say, let's say this out loud. Our, our business is arguably very open, right? You would, we, can, we can say that our business, oh yeah, there, it's very LGBTQ positive. We support everybody, we're very open. Except where are the, the gay stars, the gay male stars, especially tenors? Which gay tenors are on the stage right now that have really big significant careers? significant right yeah i mean russell R russell okay hard it's kind of like um the olden days in film rock hudson yeah. i mean he couldn't be considered the leading male i know if he was gay well that's when you've processed this there's part of me when i process things that i heard was i know that I know why they said what they said and why they advised the way they did is because they lived through a time of fear of, and they lived through a time where this was like, you know, if you wanted to have a family and be the main breadwinner, that wasn't something that females did, you know what I mean? And so, and so I, I get it, but there had to come a point where we all just said, screw you and which many of my singer friends did, I'm gonna have a family and I'm still gonna have my career. You know what I mean? It was, I know you can't equate the two because it's different. I mean, I still think about, you know, you think about the time no, when I Ellen think, came out on her show. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, I think there is equity between the two. I think they are concurrent, for sure. There's, I, a, there's triv they, it's, it's trivialized. The notion of being quiet, not having a family or being quiet about sexuality or, or feelings are congruent in that we have to hide a bit of our lives in order to have success. And I don't think hiding some life is necessary for success. I think that's the quotient. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yep. Beautifully said. I'm sorry you went through that. Me too. Um, you know what? I'm okay now. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. And you're doing really well with your career. And congratulations, honestly. Yeah. You are just, you are, a rising star and thank you for taking the time to sit and chit chat with us. I know, and I'm excited. I'm excited for this new repertoire. I can't wait to go and hear it and applaud and scream in the front row. Oh, yeah. stop it. And especially if you and Joyce get to do Tosca. Oh my God, I'll be there for that one. <laughs> wait. Well, may maybe something will happen in, in Madrid and I'll, I'll have a different tenor. Why would you say that when it's Joe singing with you? Don't be me. Joe, but I we've done Tosca. <laughs> you and Joe have We've done Tosca. <laughs> I'm waiting patiently. I'm like holding my breath. Who knows? You know what? Know. Stranger things have happened, right? Maybe we can work a deal out with Joe Kaleha. Hey, Joe. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, well, then my other tenor is Kaufman, so who knows? I won't be able to deal with him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know that you have, it's very public, your love of flying. Yeah. Are you able to enjoy that hobby everywhere? Like when you travel, you know okay. how like golfers find golf places to go play golf. That was a horrible thing to say. How I said that. Sweet Jesus. Here, get it together. Um, but <laughs> welcome to my world, Michael. Sweet Jesus. Okay. Anyway, so are you able to fly like where you are in Paris? Can you fly there? Yeah. My license allows me the rights and privileges of being an airman in the United States only. Okay. However, it doesn't mean that planes in Europe or the United Kingdom or wherever else are different. They're all literally the same. Oh, okay. The same. It's just the rules of engagement are different on the European continent. And they're different in the United Kingdom from Europe, by the way. And as a side story, so I cannot, I can fly a plane. I could rent a plane with an instructor in Europe or United Kingdom. Oh, okay. It's one. So that's what I often do. I go up and, and fly with other people when I'm in Europe. Awesome. Whereas in America, I'll rent a plane for many days and go on my own and just do it myself. Um, so here, you know, I'll go to, I'll go once the show opens, I'm going to go to the field a few times and rent a plane and go up with an instructor awesome. and keep myself current. That's it. Yay. Are you, are you able to have a license as an American in Europe or the UK? I can, and I studied. I studied first flying, actually, in England, not in the United States. That's where okay. I trained in Italy. Okay. So I actually know all the rules, uh, the flight rules in the United Kingdom as well. Mm -hmm. I just never actually got my UK airman license. Okay. So, but I can fly. You know, it, there there are exemptions too. Like if you're, if I were to be here for six months or more. Mm -hmm. I would, I would be able to get a permit to fly. Oh, okay. I'd be able to find ways to get around the rules too. That's cool. I love yeah. that. I was really curious about that. Cause I, let's you know, go, all... let's all do a trip. I'm not kidding. I love to fly my friends. It's fun. Let's do it. I'm, uh, I'm dead serious. It's an invitation. Okay. You're always a guest. Madrid. Okay. Uh, it's easy. There's a great airfield right outside of the city. Okay. We're on. I don't trust you, but you might have to give me some anxiety drugs before I get on that thing. <laughs> I'll just give you a Benadryl, Carrie. You'll be like, <sighs> you'll be out. <laughs> I mean, like if you flip that plane around, like I, 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 I might lose my shit. <laughs> I want to know something funny. I'll give you something like a little side story. I, you just talked about flipping around. I do ladies like roller coasters. Love, I love roller coasters? them. Love yeah. them. I puke my guts off even at Magic Kingdom, okay? I have a horrible time even on like the little teacup ride. Oh, no, every, wait, 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 wait. Everybody pukes on a teacup, but like small world, you know, where it's like a, just a floating boat, you'll puke on oh, small. It's gone. I was with Nadine Sierra. We went to a Disney, uh, Paris Disney a few years ago. Yeah. I said, do you know, I asked Nadine, I said, does the roller coaster go upside down? She said, oh no, sweetie, it's fine. And we got in and the harness came down and I said, I think this is going upside down. She says, no, it's not. And it immediately went up and up three, three loops immediately. That's said, are, you, are you okay? And I said, no. And we came in and I, I had, I was doing okay. And the roller coaster pulled in and everybody's harness came up except mine. And mine was broken, locked, locked me the seat. And I was locked in and they couldn't get it undone in oh, my, and I oh, said, no. I'm desperate. I'm going to throw up. I'm going to throw up. I'm going and to it lose took, shit. It, it took him two minutes and I got out. And as soon as my head got out, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. <gasps> so what, what I discovered is when I'm in control of a device, like a plane, I have oh. no problem. But the second I'm not in control of it, I'm a complete mess, which says a lot about control, the word control. That and sounds the, like a therapy session. <laughs> dang it. There's so many other things, right? Yeah. No. Oh, I'm the same way in cars. Yeah. Aha. Fast cars. So if you drive, you're okay. But if you if you're being driven, you gotta look straight forward or you're screwed. Bye -bye. Yeah, bye -bye. or if I'm in if I'm in the back of a car and I'm Ooh. facing the wrong way, Ooh. out people. I'm done. Ooh. I'm like <laughs> you know, or the train, the, the bullet train in Japan. I took that once and I was facing the wrong way. Yep, bye bye. Yep. <laughs> you can ask Christine Gerke. I'm like, yep, I gotta go. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that connects me well, up. Thank
Okay. Can we ask you some rapid fire questions? Can we Can't have wait. some fun? Are you up for it? Yeah. 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 Can we have some fun? Okay. If you could choose any magical power, what would it be? Ooh. Um, they just uh, put Harry Potter on HBO Max, people. Sorry, I had to ask that question. <laughs> seeing into the future. Seeing, seeing into the future. future. Okay. Okay, what if you ever your... get that, wait, wait, wait. If you ever get that power, you need to call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, um, are we rich yet? <laughs> am, I, am I a lawyer? What am I? Am I a lawyer? Am I a, yeah, what am I? <laughs> are we okay. living in the, are we living in the villages yet? Yeah. Are we in the villages? <laughs> Praise Jesus. Okay. Hallelujah. Yeah, you don't know about that. Carrie and I, we're, we're, when, when our husbands kick it, we're going to the villages. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and sorry. We, I mean, all singers that do not have children, we all need to protect each other all, when we're on, in walkers and, you know, we all need to take care of each other. So we're all going to the villages. You're welcome, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what is your greatest fear? Uh, drowning. Ooh, really? Do you, do yes. you have those dreams? Do you have those dreams? Yeah. I hate walking on docks next to boats. I get, it's the only time I panic, truly. I Did fully you fly. I fly, I don't scare at all. But I'm a you pilot, fly airplanes, but, but you're afraid of water. Okay. I'm not afraid of water. Drown. I want to swim, but being on a dock, where there are boats with engines on and falling in. I don't can't explain it. It's when I was young, probably because I fell in next to some boats when I was young. Oh. I have a deep fear of falling into the water next on a dock. I get panic driven on a dock. Awesome. That would also fall under carry irrational fears. <laughs> 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 okay. What was your first celebrity crush? Oh. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, Brittany. <laughs> okay. And that's the truth, actually. I had to think about, you said crush. Yeah. And before I, what I really was, let's yeah. think 14, 15 years old, I like Brittany. It was Brittany. Brittany. Yeah. What do you do or think about on long flights? Ooh, good question. What do I do? I usually read. Okay. I'm, I'm not one of those guys that puts on that television screen in front of the seat. I, it's not. always, or it has the map on. Yeah, I read. Um, long flights, I usually try to take enough melatonin to sleep and try to get on the clock. Mm. Uh, so I'm actually don't, obs I, I try to sleep as much as I can on the plane. And that's okay. about it. Okay. I wish I could take melatonin. That stuff gives me crazy ass dreams. Crazy. Don't really? worry. You're just yeah. weird. I'm just weird. <laughs> that, I know. Well, welcome to weird. the crazy party. <laughs> it's just weird. <laughs> okay. Oh, la, la, la. oh, what's the most beloved thing that you own? Oh. My piano, my Steinway. Oh. Where is that? In New Jersey. Okay. In New Jersey. Yeah. I love my instrument. If you could. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm scared. <laughs> if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Um, I would have never, uh, let me say it like this. I wish I had more hair. Oh, my husband too. <laughs> but it looks great. I like it. I, mean, I do. <laughs> it, works on, it works on you, Michael. I think it's works. super sexy. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Carrie, it's time. Okay, Michael. What is your favorite cuss word in any language? Well, I say the F word a lot. I say the F bomb a lot. I you're lucky I haven't said it on this one. <laughs> what, we're not PG rated. Mm -mm. Uh, no, we cuss. Uh, I can, I can. I mean, I'm a New Jersey boy, so I can really let it rip. Oh, so you you're you're good with the stage hands at mm -hmm. the men, especially. I do well. Okay. Do we need the last one now, Carrie? Yes. If heaven exists, what do you want to hear God say as you walk through the pearly gates? Um, oh, good question. Wow. No one's ever asked that question. Ooh. What do I want God to say? Um, I hope he says you're forgiven. You know, that's a first. Yeah. I hope he says you're forgiven. I mean, we're all sinners. I'm a believer. So I'm a Catholic. And um, I think all of us, obviously, we all are sinners to some degree. And uh, 
I beg forgiveness for my, my errors and my mistakes and I hope I'm forgiven. Beautiful. I think he'll say yes. I I hope so. Or she, he or she. Well, thanks for joining us today. And, I know. And I, lucky me, I get to see you very soon anyway, but yay. Huge hugs, soon. Michael. Thank you so toy, much. Toy, toy, for Thank your your opening. Toy, Thank toy, you. toy. Oh my God, we're so excited. Thank and you. Just, You're sweet. just enjoy it. Enjoy every minute. Only 800 people, but I promise you, it's going to sound like 3,000 when they applaud. It's crazy. It's going to be amazing. And I'm very excited. I think your favorite moment should include Odolchimani. That's such a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's what I said. Up and up until the aria of Odolchimani. When it ends, it ends. That's the whole section that I love. Oh, okay, got it. Like I that love whole that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I like the more intimate moments. Act three, I just find like wait, wait. <laughs> oh, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. wait, wait. Wait, wait. I love <laughs> Act three. Oh, Sandra, you suck. I love Act, act three, three, except when I jump. That's the best. When, when Tosca gets to jump, that's fun. But for, for Tosca is actually in act one. When you say, I love that bit. I Fabulous. love that bit. Incredible music. Who's the baritone? Uh, Tessier. <gasps> He's a good Scarpia. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Well, Please. have fun. Toy, 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 toy. Toy, toy, toy. Thank we will see you soon. Thanks for joining okay. us today. All right, guys, take care. You too. Bye. Bye. What do you guys do when you're on the, we you play with our hair and our lipstick? And I have to move my lights. Like the, I, I keep the white. Moving. You see the light. Yeah. You see the light and you see the light and you see the light. I don't know. I don't know. What did you have in your Fruit Loops today? Okay, yes, you you look pretty. Okay, we both need to get our hair done. <laughs> Just gonna say that.